John's Gospel, the first chapter. This uh, study is a precursor to tomorrow and uh, to the consecration which is forthcoming. Uh, you know, since all night prayer is tomorrow, and uh, the subject matter that I'll be dealing with tonight is much of the subject matter that we're going to be entertaining in the all night prayer on tomorrow night. It has to do with the glory of God as he reveals himself and his glory to us, the purpose behind it and what we are to do with it, etc., etc., etc. John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 3. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Then we go all the way down to verse 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We're dealing with the glory, the glory of God. Heavenly Father, we thank you. For this day, it's another day that you made. We rejoice in it and we're glad. We thank you for the opportunity that you've given us to be in the house of the Lord and to systematically go through the word. It is our desire, it is our prayer, it is our aim to see to it that we are enriched as we spend this time in your presence and that we leave here fortified, ready to face the challenges that lie before us and putting our confidence and trust in God to be victorious over all of the wilds of the enemy. Strengthen us, anoint us, empower us for your service. Well, thank you for the results as we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I don't know, did you announce uh, Brother Morris? Okay. Um, three parts to what I want to share with you tonight. One has to do with the fact that the Word dwells with us. The second part has to do with the Word is the glory of God. And the third part is that the Word shares His glory with us. Now, I begin simply by saying greatness is not always recognized or appreciated in the world and society in which we live. And I believe one of the reasons why greatness is not recognized and appreciated is because we have different definitions for greatness. Some people determine greatness based upon how much money you make, others by where you live, Others by what job you have. Another by how many likes you have on Facebook. Greatness is determined by many people and it's very superficial in many instances. John in his gospel makes the amazing statement concerning Jesus. And what does he say about Jesus? He was in the world, though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. That's John chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. Can you imagine Jesus coming into the world and the world not perceiving who he was, even though he made declarations concerning himself, and in his adult life he manifested qualities and traits that could only be manifested by deity. He had the power to reverse death. He could take a dead person and bring them back to life. That was something that was unheard of in their time, and it's unheard of even today because we don't have that kind of power. Yet Jesus could say to a friend, wake up, and he woke up. He could do those things because he was not simply a man, he was the Son of God, and people did not recognize him. Even when the divine glory was radiating from him, the world still did not see or understand who he was and what he came to do. John said in the 14th verse, we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only. So it's possible for people even in this world in which we live today to see God manifesting himself through his creation and still miss God in the process. That's why people even today are worshiping images, idols. They worship nature. They worship anything but the true and living God. But the one thing I want to begin with is the fact that the word dwells among us. John identified Jesus as the word. The invisible became visible. The untouchable became touchable. And the unknowable became knowable. Jesus came to reveal himself. He came to touch. The Bible is filled with illustrations where Jesus touched people and they were delivered and set free from infirmities. 
Something was transferred in the touch that changed and transformed the lives of those he encountered. He became the visible manifestation of God in the flesh. And those he touched were healed and set free and delivered from all kinds of diseases. And he came to make himself known. So the spirit became flesh. And what did that flesh do? Dwelt among us. It's the greatest miracle that the world has ever known. When Jesus became flesh, dwelt among us, and revealed to us the purpose of God for each and every one of our lives. When John says that the gospel, uh, uh, in his gospel rather, that the word became flesh, he used the Greek word similar to those which we find in the culture dealing with uh, the word, which is logos. Logos is the written word. Jesus came not only to write the word, but to emblazon it on the hearts of those who would follow him and recognize him as their Messiah, their Savior. The word on the page uh, has some authority, but the word delving into our hearts and carving itself into our hearts has the power to bring about transformation. There are people who know the Bible better than we do. You go to Israel, you meet a tour guide, they know the Old Testament backward and forward, and they can relate the Old Testament to the New Testament when they get to the sites that are historical to the Christians. And yet they don't have a knowledge of who God is or who Jesus is. They're still looking for their Messiah. And yet they're telling the guests and the tourists who come into the country that this is what the, the Bible says concerning Jesus the Messiah, that he was born here, he was raised here, his miracle took place here, he was crucified here, and from this place he rose from the dead. And then you say to them, do you believe that? They say, no, I don't believe it. That's just what the history books tell us. That's what I had to learn in order to get this job. So you can imagine Jesus in the flesh walking among people and they still missed him. If we're missing him today with all of these signs and evidences to who he was and what his purpose was, it is highly possible that people even today are continuing to miss the person of Jesus Christ. But what I want you to recognize is that Jesus was not abstract in what he did. He was precise in what he did and he came to reveal himself to man. He came to reveal himself because he recognized that man in sin could not find a way out of his dilemma without divine assistance. And he came unto who? His own first and his own received him not. They did not receive him as their Messiah. But thank God to as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God. So today we are sons and daughters of God by spiritual adoption. And the word which was written on the page is spoken into our hearts and lives and that's what brings about transformation. We cannot receive Christ without his divine assistance. He's the one who allows the Holy Spirit to convict us of sin and convince us of righteousness and make us aware of the fact that we need a transformation to take place in our lives. Amen? And the Word of God says if we are in Christ, what are we? We're a new creation. So the world is full of words already, but the words that are in the world cannot bring transformation because much of the world's word has no life to it other than that which is written. But Jesus came to reveal the word and to convince us that the word is true so that even after he ascended back to the Father, we would have the living word abiding in our hearts and we'd have the written word to read that would be in agreement with what the living word speaks into our lives so that we could grow and mature and become more substantial as the sons and daughters of God. Each and every one of us is responsible to know the word of God and to know the author of the book so that the Word of God comes alive. It's not enough just to read it. We have to read it with understanding and then apply that which is read to our lives so that we can be transformed by the grace and by the power of God. Amen? And if the Word became more than just words, then we, what we call that living Word is the Scripture, the divine and holy Word of God. And that can only take place when it is divinely inspired. There are many books people read, and the book may change their uh, psychology toward life, their posture toward their fellow man, and many other aspects of their lives can be transformed by what they read. But at the end of the book, when they close the book and put it back on the shelf, they're still sinners. The only book that we can read that actually takes us from sin to redemption and salvation is the living Word of God. And Jesus came to fully authorized the word by living it and by confirming what the word of God said he would do, 
proving that he was the son of God by doing just that. The word really became flesh. He stepped out of the words of the scripture so that we could have more than a prophecy or a moral code. We would have God himself standing among us. So I can say clearly that in the word of God, it's known as Emmanuel. And Emmanuel means God with us. So God is with us here today in this place. We may not see him in the physical sense, but he's with us because he abides within each and every one of our hearts. And the beautiful thing about God abiding with us is that there's a consistency that goes from individual to individual. We don't have different concepts of who God is because he revealed himself in his word. If we take his word as the revelation, then we are in full agreement that he is in the midst of his people. The Bible says he what? Dwells in the midst of us. So if he's dwelling, then that means he's with us. And he abides within each and every one of our hearts. And what this says to me is that each of us should be a reflection of, 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 of Jesus Christ. Your life in some way should reflect the qualities of the kingdom and of Jesus. So that a lost world that's looking for an answer won't stop at the church and think that the answer is in the church. Because you know the answer is not in the church. People who go to church can be very disappointed because they won't find what they're looking for. The answer is in the Christ of the church. And he abides within us because we are the church. We are the body of Christ. We are the ones that God has placed here to make himself real to each one so that we can say for ourselves, I know in whom I have believed. And I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Amen? Amen. And we know him to be our Emmanuel. And the word of God goes on to tell us in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 17. For this reason he had to be made like his brothers in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. In order for Jesus Christ to be our true example, he had to become like us, and had to live above the reproach of Satan, so that we could know through the power of his life and example that we too can live above Satan's reproach. I've learned this. My father used to say it often. If you want to be kept, he can keep you. So the question with many of us is when we are vacillating, how, are, are we really serious about being kept? Because if we are serious about being kept, he'll keep us. And the word of God says he'll protect us and keep us from falling so that he can one day present us faultless before his presence with exceeding joy. The glory of Christ is that if we want him, he's in full measure to reveal himself to us and to preserve us, and to protect us, and then to give us the necessary equipment so that we can shine as lights in a dark world. That is why it is important for us, if we're going to embrace him, that we have the Holy Spirit manifesting himself within us. When Jesus was ready to leave his disciples, he said, I will not leave you comfortless. Another way of saying that is, I will not leave you without defense. I will not leave you destitute. I'm going to send you another comforter. And the Greek word is the parakletos, or the paraclete, and that is one who's called alongside. So the Holy Spirit comes to abide with us and give us the ability to be triumphant and victorious in the face of all of the challenges that we face today. Jesus made his dwelling among us, and when he did that, he did that so that we could be triumphant and victorious over all of the wilds of the enemy and over life itself. In the Greek, uh, rather in the Hebrew again, no, it's, it's in the Greek, there's a word uh, that is used, it's called, uh, let me see, eskenosin, which means to pitch a tent. So the question is, when the tabernacle was built in the wilderness, how come they used uh, the material of a tent and not brick and mortar as it were to build the tabernacle? Well, the answer is very simple there. It's because Israel was a nomadic people at that time, and they were moving from place to place. You can't move a building, but you can fold the tent and move the tent. And every time they reestablished a location according to the leading of God, and they set the tent in the center of the camp, any time they would leave their tent and look toward the center, they would see the, the visual presence of God dwelling in the midst of his people. Now, they didn't just see the, 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 the skins, and the material from which the tent was made, but every day, what did they see? They saw, no, not just the sacrifice, by day they saw the cloud, which protected them from the heat, 
And it also showed them that God was in the midst of his people. And what did he show them by night? The pillar of fire, which was their protection. And it gave them warmth in the desert. And it also uh, war warded off those enemies that would try to overtake them in the middle of the night. If you've ever been in the desert in the winter time, in the summer it can be 100 degrees and at night it can go down to 30 degrees. So as the Israelites were traveling through that desert experience, they needed protection by day and by night. And God was there in the midst of the camp and all they had to do was look up. All they had to do was leave their tents and look up because the way they were situated in the wilderness, there were three on the north side, three on the south side, three on the east side, and three on the west side. So when they'd leave their tent, if they looked toward the center of the camp, they would see the glory of God in the midst of his people. Isn't that a blessing? Yes. Now we can leave our door where we live. We can walk out of the church and look in any direction we want. We won't necessarily see the glory of God because he doesn't have to reveal himself that way to us anymore. The glory of God is within us. The glory of God abides within the heart and life of each individual who is living the submit, submitted and surrendered life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you want to know he's with you, all you have to do is open your mouth and begin to give him some praise. Because he dwells in, he tabernacles in the midst of his, our praises. And when we praise him, we are equipped and empowered by the Holy Spirit to do great exploits. When Israel would go to battle against their adversaries when they were on their way to Canaan, what was the first thing they did when there was a battle? They sent Judah first. They began to praise God. And in the midst of their praise, God revealed himself to them. And God was the one who fought their battles for them. He gave them victory over everybody who stood in opposition to his desire and his will for their lives. And what he did for them, he does for us today. That is why when you're in trouble, learn how to give God some praise. In the midst of your praise, God will dispatch angels, emissaries, who will surround you and protect you from the enemy and give you victory over the enemy. And when you come through your situation, you will recognize that it was God who helped you. One songwriter said, through many dangers, toils, and snares, we have already come. It was grace that brought us safe thus far, and grace will lead us home. So we have confidence in that fact. And Israel looked to the tabernacle for the presence of God to be in their midst. And when they saw the tabernacle, they knew in the tent of meeting, that is where they would have their encounters with God. And it was important that God's presence resided there. Because if the tent was the only place and not the surrounding area, the tent wasn't large enough for all of Israel. But the tent was the focal point and then the glory manifested up from the tent. Because what room was there in the tent where the presence of God was constantly abiding? The most holy place, the holy of holies. And that's where their authority, that's where their anointing, that's where their power that's where their peace, that's where their protection and provision came from. That's where their praise was supposed to emanate. Because if they look back and saw where God brought them from, and they realized that it was God who did it for them, they should immediately begin to praise him. But you know what I've learned about Israel? We're just like them. No matter what God has done for us, we still have reason to murmur and complain. Is that the best you can do? Why didn't you do it yesterday? We have all kinds of reasons why we can argue with God because he didn't manifest himself like we wanted him to. But God is never late. He's always on time. He's never deficient. Whatever God does is good. We can read in the book of Genesis during the six days of creation. After every aspect of creation, what did God say? That's good. That means it can't be improved upon. It can't be modified to be better. God is perfect in all of his ways. So even when he ministers to us, when he chooses to rather than we want him to, we can still say at the end of the day, that's good. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good and his mercy endures forever. So to the Hebrews, it meant that wherever they went on their wanderings, they knew that God would be with them. And we know that God is with us wherever we go because our steps are ordered by God. 
And if we allow him to order our steps, he will only lead us in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though it looks many times as if all is lost, if God be for us, who can be against us? Jesus tabernacles among us. And he's walking in the midst of his people to give us divine help and protection over all of the wilds of the enemy. He lives with us and he goes wherever we go. And if we understand that fully, then we will have no fear of anything that Satan says is going to happen. Because he has no control over your life. Did you know that? Satan has no control over your life whatsoever. You are hidden with Christ in God. And if that is your position, then Satan, if he comes after you, if you're under attack, always be reminded, as you read in the book of Job, that if God releases Satan to come against you, he's already given you the standard of victory so that you will overcome the wilds of the enemy. And as you study the word of God, you recognize if he allows the test, or the trial to come your way, it is not to break you, but it's to make you all that he would have you to be. How do you go from one victory to the next victory? Trusting God every step of the way. He knows the way that I take, and after the trial, I come forth as pure gold. If he knows the way that I'm taking, because my steps have been ordered by him, I can give him glory, whether I'm in victory or whether I'm under attack. I don't have to see uh, the enemy defeated to know that he's defeated because I walk by faith not by sight the enemy's defeated even though he doesn't know it he thinks he's got me where he wants me but it's only a setup for God to reveal himself and give me victory over the enemy amen so whether it's daytime we get the cloud whether it's nighttime we get the fire but we know that God is with us and for this reason we give him thanks. Now, the brilliant cloud of glory was also called the Shekinah glory. That word Shekinah means dwelling. It was the manifest presence of God dwelling in the midst of his people. It's the same way when Moses went up to Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments. They said when he came down, he, he was, his face was a glow. You can't be in the presence of God and come back the way you left. When you are in the presence of God, something takes place and people will be aware that you've been with God. Now, they may not have all the answers to where you were, but they'll know something's different about you. And the difference is that God has fit you for the journey as he's exposed himself to you and revealed himself to you. And in the case of Moses, it was so overwhelming that... Uh, uh, the people recognized he'd been with God and they became fearful over the fact that God could be such a transforming God. What God does for one, he can do for all. You remember the narrative where Israel said to Moses, we're tired of you telling us what God wants? If God wants to tell us something, you tell him to come down here himself. Can you imagine God's creation being so bold and brazen? You tell Moses, you go on up there and tell God to come on down here himself. They're tired of hearing you tell us what God's saying. So Moses did what they asked him. He went to God and said, God, they want to hear it from you. God said, okay, well, you tell them to separate themselves, wash their garments, put on white, put a fence around the mountain. I'll come down. Now, God in, in, in shrouded himself in a cloud. Why did God put himself in a cloud? Nobody can look at God and live. If he came down without the cloud, anybody who looked up and saw him would have died. So in the midst of their folly, he loved them still too much to allow that to happen, so he enshrouded himself in a cloud. But now when God, the creator, comes down, strange things begin to happen. So the earth began to shake, the mountains belching smoke. Everything around them is transforming. Those Israelites were so frightened. They ran and hid themselves. 
And after that, they said, Moses, you tell us what God wants us to do, and we'll do it. Be careful what you ask for. Because in many instances, if God gives you exactly what you want, you won't be ready to handle it. But God always gives us what is in our best interest. Amen? The cloud of glory was also that which parted the Red Sea. So the, the glory of God is a powerful thing. The second thing is that the Word is the glory of God. The Word tells us we have seen His glory, the glory of the one and the only, who came from the Father full of grace. When we want to associate the term glory with God, we're saying something about His character, His divine character. When John uses the term glory, he is not talking about Christ's future coming in glory. He is emphasizing the appearance of the long-awaited glory that had now become present in the world. The glory of God is what people anticipated, and now it was here, dwelling in the midst. What was John thinking about? Well, I think he's thinking about Jesus when he was baptized. Because when Jesus was baptized, we have the evidence of it with the dove descending. We have the word, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And all of this points to the fact that Jesus was the son of God, that he came into the world for a specific purpose and that was unfolding even at that very moment. So when we consider this, we have to recognize the fact that the Word is the glory of God. We have no higher revelation of God today than His Word. Outside of His presence abiding with us, there's nothing more than the Word. Now, because God is not the author of confusion, nothing that the Lord does in the midst of His people has authority higher than the Word that God has revealed to us in Scripture. Do you know what I'm talking about? There are people who claim to have extra biblical revelation. Where they say it's not in the Bible, but God showed me this. And God told me that. God will never give people any revelation or word that cannot be backed up with scripture. That is the highest revelation that God has given us of himself. So when the Holy Spirit speaks to you, he is agreeing with Scripture. When the Holy Spirit is manifesting himself in your life, he is in agreement with the Word. Because the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So he's not only agreeing with the written Word, he's agreeing with the living Word. Because there's a consistency with everything that is done in the Godhead. Understanding? So when Jesus was baptized, we have the evidence of that baptism. And the fact that there was full agreement. Perhaps he was thinking about the times he saw Jesus heal people. Or the times that Jesus fed the, the thousands of people by mul multiplying the fish and the bread. All of these things reveal the glory of God manifested in Jesus. Because those were works that could, be, could not be done by mortal individuals. You know, I sometimes I think about... Jesus feeding the 5,000. Now that's 5,000 men, not counting the women and children. But he takes little fish and little loaves, prays, and blesses it, and then begins to break. And every time he breaks it, somehow or other, it replenishes. And he fills one basket, then he fills two baskets, then he fills six baskets, then he fills eight baskets. Then he fills 10 baskets. Then he fills 12 baskets. And the disciples are going all throughout the region where the people are seated, feeding them so that they can eat. And then he says, gather all the leftovers. Let nothing be wasted. And even after everybody ate sumptuously, they came back with 12 baskets still full. Can you imagine? When I, when I read things like that, I, I know it happened because I, I believe it by faith. But I would just like to have seen something like that. Where you come with nothing and you end up with more than anybody can handle. But that's the way God is. God blesses us in ways that we can't even imagine. We're looking for something little and 
minuscule and God blesses us with something bigger and more capable than we could possibly imagine. And it's the glory of God that's being revealed to us at those times. So we can thank God for his glory being revealed each and every day. John was with God in, in the person of Jesus Christ when he raised the widow's son from the dead in Luke chapter 7. He was there with Jairus' daughter when she was raised. He was there when Lazarus was raised from the dead in John 11. He saw the glory of God. He saw the glory of God revealed in each and every one of those situations. He was there when Jesus was transfigured before the eyes of everyone who was standing looking at his ascension. He saw the glory of Christ's face as he began to shine like the sun and his clothing became as bright as light in Matthew chapter 17 verses 1 through 10. He saw all of this and as a result it was not difficult for him to be a follower, to be a disciple, a devotee, an adherent of Jesus Christ. Well the key for us is even though we haven't seen those things to still believe. We should not be like Thomas who has to see in order to believe. We should believe because God has spoken the word. And if the word that God has spoken is true, then we have to take it for what it says and apply it to our lives so that God is glorified. Amen? So we have the written word which comes alive and becomes the word of God to each and every one of us. That is why if we really say that we are sons of God and daughters of God, we have to be devoted to studying his word, reading the Bible. And we don't just read the Bible haphazardly. But we read it because it's food for our soul, it's marrow for our spiritual bones. We read it to receive divine instruction and revelation of who God is and what he wants us to do for him. And when we consider this, then we become like John and we think even of the glory of the resurrection. The fact that this life, as we know it today, one day will soon be over. And uh, the Lord is coming back for uh, people who are looking for and longing for his appearance. So if we are really manifesting the glory of God, we have to recognize that this world is not it for us. We have to wear the world, as has been said before, like a loose garment. So that when Jesus is ready to call us home, we have nothing to clamor for, we can let the world go and immediately go into the presence of the Lord. John was thinking, no doubt, of the ascension of Jesus when he went back to heaven. Now he saw it, we see it by faith, and we have to make sure that we are ready for that day when it comes. To be sure, I think that John had seen God's glory, and the glory that he saw was Jesus, and he revealed it in his word. The glory of God that we see is what? Is manifested in transformed lives. Is manifested when we read the word and the word becomes alive. Have you ever read a scripture that one day after you've read it maybe a hundred times all of a sudden it just leaps off the page? Almost to the point where it startles you. It's like the word actually takes on a, a, a life force. And you say, how could I have missed this all these years? How could I read this passage of scripture seven, eight times and I've never seen what I'm seeing now? God is exposing more of his glory. He's giving you a deeper look. He's giving you a more intimate view of what the word is all about. That is why I don't care if you read the Bible ten times. There's still things you can learn. I don't care how much of the Bible you've memorized. There are things that God will reveal to you from his word when you get to the point where you can handle it. Because we can't all handle what we want to. We think we can. But God matures us and equips us so that we can handle the, the measure of what he reveals to us. The third point is what John was making is that the word shares the glory of God. No, I, I did that. I did that. He shares the word with us. That's what I just finished doing. Yes, and he shares his word with us. The word is the glory. 
He shares his word with us. That's why, okay, let me say this to maybe bring final clearance to it. If he doesn't reveal the word to us, then we won't understand the word. But because he reveals it, we get the full meaning and the full measure of the word as revealed by God through the power of the Holy Spirit. So that when we read it, it's not just the word we're reading, but it's the word of God, the living, breathing, animated word of God. Does that help you, Bev? Okay. Point number three is what I was just getting ready to say. You made me lose my place. Shame on you. Yeah, but I got to get to my notes. Okay. He shares his glory with us. The incredible thing about the grace and the love of God is he does not keep his glory to himself. He could keep his glory to himself and not reveal or expose any of it to us. But he exposes and reveals his glory to each and to every one of us. He shares it with his children. Paul said in 2 Thessalonians 2 and 14, he called you to, his, to, to this through our gospel that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he wants to share it with us. And the reason he wants to share his glory with us is so that we can be effective in living this life and manifesting that glory to a lost and a dying world. You want to see people changed? Let the glory of God be revealed in you. People are not changed because you bring them to church. They're changed because they, they get a glimpse of the glory of God. It exposes them as to where they really are. And if they recognize they're lost and they're looking for an answer, and the glory of God is revealed, the Holy Spirit can convict them of sin, convince them of righteousness, and bring them to the place where they can say, what must I do to be saved? That's what it's all about. In 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 1, it says, The morning elders... To the morning elders among you, I appeal as a, follow, a fellow elder, a witness of Christ's suffering, and the one who also will share his glory to be revealed. The word is filled with different illustrations and narratives where the Lord is sharing his glory with us. We mortals in our present earthly state continually fall short of God's glory. Continually. And the reason we fall short of God's glory is because we were born flawed. We were born sinners. We were born missing the mark. And if we don't allow the Holy Spirit to overshadow us each and every day, we can miss the mark from time to time on our journey. It doesn't mean we, we wanted to, but it means we stepped outside of the grace, outside of the covering. That's why I'm thankful that the Word of God says if we confess our sins to Him, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So even if I miss it, and I realize I've missed it, I can get back to God and pick up where I left off and continue on this journey. And uh, the Bible lets us know in Romans 3.23, we've, we've all sinned. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. None of us has uh, been per perfect from the day we were born. His glory is a gift it is to be manifested in his people who are to be the tabernacle of God. We are the tabernacle of God, so he wants it to be revealed in us. When the world looks at us, they should see the smoke, the Shekinah glory. They should look at us in the evening situations of life and see the fire of the Holy Spirit manifesting himself within us. Whatever the world needs, we've been equipped to handle it. And we can be effective in doing what God has called us to do when we make ourselves available to him. His glory is a gift to be manifested in us. And uh, if we really want to be the tabernacle of God, we simply have to make ourselves available to him. The word of God says in 1 Corinthians six nineteen, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? You've been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. So we have a responsibility to 
to glorify him. We've been equipped to glorify him. There's no reason why we cannot glorify him. If we walk in the confidence we have as believers, we can glorify him each and every day. People ought to see the glory of God in us. When the world looks at you, what do they see? When the church looks at you, what do they see? If we don't see the glory of God, then whatever's hindering that glory needs to be dealt with. It doesn't mean that we become so deep that we can't relate to the world. When you read about Jesus in Scripture, he was a very relatable person. Even as the Son of God, he had a social life. He didn't spend all his days in the temple. He actually engaged in discourse with people. He went to the houses of sinners. He had friends like Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. So we can't be so deep that we can't relate to people. If we're going to win people, we've got to engage them. And they've got to see that we're in the world but not of the world. They've got to see that they can live triumphantly and victoriously with Christ and they're not missing out on anything other than the rigors of sin that ravage the lives of those who don't live according to God's word. So they've got to see the glory of God in us. That is our responsibility. And the word of God lets us know in Matthew 5, 16, that we're to let our light so shine before men that they will see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. We have to let our light shine. We are to radiate with the glory of God so that people will see our good deeds and glorify our Father, not glorify us, but glorify the God who's given us the ability to do what we do. And Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Again, reinforcing the fact that what we do should bring glory and honor to God each and every day. We also read it in uh, Philippians 2.14. Do everything without complaining or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in, in which you shine as stars like the universe. So he wants us to see to it that everything we do is done with the right spirit, with the right posture, with the right attitude, not with murmuring, not with complaining and arguing. But if we're going to be blameless and pure children of God without fault, we have to see to it that we celebrate and we let the glory of God be revealed through us each and every day. Amen? If the glory of God is manifesting in your life, somebody's going to notice Somebody's going to be changed. And you will have an opportunity to have something to lay at the feet of Jesus when you meet him face to face. Because I'm convinced that when the Lord comes back and we have the judgment of the saints, that the only thing he's looking for is the harvest that he assigned to each and every one of us. And if you have no harvest to give to him, what did, you do? what did you do with the life that he gave to you? Just go to church, sing, clap, dance, and fall out every now and then and get up and go on about your business? Or do we actually invest in the lives of others by letting them see the power of God working within us? If that's what we're doing, then God is going to get the glory and we will get the reward that he's promised to those who are faithful to the end. Paul wrote to the Romans and he said, Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worthy comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. That's Romans 8, 17 and 18. I like the fact that he said the glory that will be revealed in us, which means the glory is there. We simply have to give it an opportunity to manifest itself so that people will see it for themselves and then come to know whom we know as Lord and Savior of their lives. All we have to do is get down to serious business and give God what he wants. And if we do that, 
He will enable us each and every day to be more than conquerors and victors over all that Satan throws at us. We have the power of God working within us to will and to do of his good pleasure. And each and every one of us can say that the word of God dwells with us, that the word of God is the glory of God that manifests itself in our lives, and the word shares his glory with us because the Christ that we serve shares the glory of God with us so that we can shine as lights and bring transformation into the lives of those who put their confidence and trust in him. Amen? Well, that's what I have for you for tonight. I've come to the end of the journey. And uh, before we go any further, I'm going to ask you to bow your heads for just a minute. Is there anybody here today who wants the word to dwell with you? Who wants the glory of the word to be revealed through you? And you're willing to make the sacrifice and the surrender to make it possible. All you have to do is get down to business with God. Acknowledge your need and believe that Jesus Christ will save you from your sins and transform you. Anyone here who's willing to acknowledge their need, believe that Jesus, the life giver, came to give them life abundantly and willing to confess it. If so, slip your hand up and put it down. I'll pray for you. You're not joining the church, but you're coming to Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God. Anybody at all? If I see no hands, then I'm going to assume that all in divine presence are walking with the Lord. And I'm just going to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity we've had today to sit here and to receive impartation concerning your glory and your desire to reveal your glory to us and to equip us with your glory so that we will be able to do great exploits that will bring honor to your name. Help us not to miss it. Help us to rise to the occasion every time and help us to be effective because we are submitted to your authority doing your will, and getting the results that you have foreordained. Help us in the areas of our deficiency. Help us in the area of our shortcomings. And help us to see ourselves from your perspective so that we will do what is necessary to improve and to become the light and the salt that you've called us to be. We're going to thank you for the results because we know there are many who will come to Christ because we gave you an unconditional yes. Thank you for what you're going to do as we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Yeah.